Okay, well, uh, welcome to the presentation on uh, archaeological work at the Tristan de Luna expedition. Uh, my name is John Wirth. Um, I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of West Florida in Pensacola. Uh, back in 1984, I was uh, attended the National Youth Science Camp. Had a wonderful time there. Really memorable. Um, have maintained contact since then, and uh, really, really appreciate the invitation to come talk to everyone. Um, I'm going to talk initially a little bit about archaeology and what it is and sort of how, what the science of archaeology is, um, briefly to get a little intro, um, sort of connect it to the broader topic of science in general. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit, of course, about the content of what we've been finding and how we've been approaching uh, doing archaeological work on this uh, 16th century Spanish expedition here in Florida. So uh, archaeology in the United States is a part of the discipline of anthropology. So I I teach in the anthropology department, um, but just to show you kind of how that works, Americanist anthropology is different in Europe and other places, but in, in the United States, uh, what most people think of anthropologists is cultural anthropology, who, people who study living cultures. Uh, we also have anthropological linguistics, which is another subdiscipline, one of four, and they study, obviously, language as a component of human culture. We also have biological anthropology which is the study of skeletal remains and the physical aspects of uh, being a human being. And then finally, what we're going to talk about today is archaeology, which is really the specialization inside anthropology, which is the study of material culture, trying to interpret as much as we can about past cultures, about past events, about past people uh, through the material traces. So if we were to find Anthropology is the systematic study of human, cultural, and biological variation in time and space. Archaeology would be the systematic study of the material traces of past human behavior in order to learn about human culture. And so to give you kind of a sense of this, uh, we have, of course, we're, we're looking at trying to get at cultures in the past. And when I say that, I mean cultures as they manifested at the individual level. You know, each person is a representative of a a way of life, a way of thinking, uh, approach to doing things, part of a society. And then at the, at the general level, sort of what does it all mean together? So really we're looking at cultures, but we're actually looking at individual human behaviors because obviously we're all individuals. So each individual acts and practices and, and behaves in such a way that ultimately leaves material traces. So when we go out and study things from the past, what we're really doing is studying that which is left behind long after the human actors did anything. And so those material traces are obviously only a small fragment of all the totality of human actions and behaviors that occurred at any given archaeological site or wherever. But nonetheless, there's an additional leap we have to make, and that is that whatever material traces that were there on the landscape over time may have decomposed, um, may have washed away, may have been modified by armadillo burrows or gopher tortoises or trees falling over. So ultimately, the science of archaeology is about interpreting the current, present day traces that we have of past human behaviors, whatever's preserved, and then we try to back interpret what behaviors generated those material things, and then from that set of behaviors that we can interpret. We try to then interpret something about the broader culture in general. So there's a lot to it. Um, but we do take a scientific approach because systematic empirical evidence is what archaeology is based on. So one additional way to look at this is to see human culture as being comprised of three main domains. One is the behavioral domain, meaning what we do as people. Uh, number two is the mental domain, what we think. Uh, and then three, part of human culture is the material domain, meaning the tools, the technologies, the physical things, the spaces we build, monuments, houses, uh, modifications to landscapes. So these three things, what people do, what people think, and what people make, um, are part of, uh, basically within, you can look at it at least as a part of human culture. Obviously, behavior and uh, thought, uh, affect one another, obviously not always in a one-to-one -one relationship, but people think things that they don't do, they do things that they didn't think about, but, you know, for the most part, there is a relationship between what's in your mind and what, what your actions are, and that, of course, is how human culture is social, meaning 
people communicate things, they, which is an action. They learn things, they preserve things, they have memories, and ultimately that behavioral and mental relationship, what we do and what we think, is the fundamental element um, of culture. But behavior is the only thing that can actually leave a material trace. And this is an important little aspect because I've never dug up a thought, meaning there's no way that somebody's thought path processes or patterns of um, sort of mental state can ever materialize. It has to only materialize through whatever people did. So every artifact I've ever dug up, every post hole, uh, every shipwreck, everything that's physically present is a result of one individual or one individual working with other individuals making or doing stuff. So anyway, the point here, though, is that the material domain does influence the behavioral and it influences the mental at the time of the culture. So in other words, what people do and think in the past is, of course, not totally independent of their material uh, things, their technology, their physical spaces and all that. And then finally, the material traces that remain to the present that are not accompanied by text or anything else, and that's what mostly archaeology focuses on, that's the archaeological data that I as a scientist look at, is I'm looking at the traces that are left of the material domain. I have direct access to what people did to make that material or make those traces, but I have only indirect access back to what the thought patterns, like why people did certain things. But fortunately for a historical period archaeology, what we call historical archaeology, we also have documentary data. And basically the documents are textual renderings, basically verbs, you know, spoken word that's been rendered into print or something physical so that it's preserved, it's crystallized, and that makes it material. And then that documentary data, which can, of course, be copied, uh, printed, translated, and all that, but still that documentary information actually does give you a sort of direct insight into what people thought in the past. And the reason all this is important is because trying to figure out the Luna expedition as a specific example of a Spanish attempt to colonize the United States in the 16th century, uh, the Luna expedition is studied using a combination of both documents and archaeological data. Um, the documents cannot tell everything. For one thing, documents never give you direct access to what people really did because People can see things differently, they can lie, they can make stuff up, they can forget. And so archaeology actually is where we see on the ground the physical traces of what people in the past did. Um, so things they never wrote about that never got preserved as documents, like the lives of the Aztec Indians who came along on the Luna expedition, or the lives of the African slaves who were brought along, or the women and children, that information may actually be recorded to some extent through the behavioral traces we find in the, in the form of artifacts and spaces that were built using wooden posts set into the ground, things like that. So that's a very brief overview of the science of archaeology, um, just to show you the kind of things we actually work with. It's artifacts, which are things that we, we can see that were made, used, or modified by people. We also have ecofacts, which would be traces of the natural environment, things like food, uh, food objects, um, pollen that might tell us something about the uh, forest or the grasses that are around there, what they might have been growing, um, et cetera. In addition to the physical things that we can pick up, we also have a tremendous amount of information in the archaeological deposits themselves, meaning the strata or the horizontal layers of sediment, which are the matrix in which we see features or vertical distributions disturbances, rather, that cross-cut these strata. And what I'm talking about here, and I'll show you in a moment what this exactly means, is that every time anybody in the past um, dug a hole in the ground and then set a wooden post, and then either the house burned or somebody pulled the post or it rotted in place, the stains and disturbances that are left behind in the soil allow us to determine where they put a post or where there's a line of posts. Um, and there's, there's all sorts of pit features and things, trenches that might be, be excavated. So a lot of our information, in fact, really the most important information is contextual, meaning it's not what I find at an archaeological site, it's where I found it in relationship to everything else. It's the vertical distribution with respect to soils and 
potentially modern soil deposits that were dumped on top of older ones, things like that. And then, of course, we also have structures or monuments that are part of the record as well. Finally, uh, just to kind of get to some of the hard science connections, the techniques that archaeologists make use of as a part of this broader study of the material traces of past cultures include a range of different techniques. Um, I've broken a few examples down into remote sensing, uh, which we've actually used at our site where we run uh, an instrument across the ground, a ground penetrating radar, and that allows us by sending signals into the ground, uh, we can gauge where certain disturbances or anomalies are located. And that can eventually lead us to where uh, post holes are or possibly large pits or who knows what else. We, we can eventually maybe find, for example, the church, which had uh, probably hundreds of human burials in it, and at some point um, it might show up as a, as a row of disturbances in a ground penetrating radar. So we wouldn't actually necessarily have to dig it in order to see it. Um, anyway, those are various techniques that you see there listed. Absolute dating, we use uh, basically physics, what uh, physicists have learned about uh, radioactive decay, to be able to date uh, archaeological specimens. So, for example, we can date organic materials like uh, human bone, or we can date animal bone, we can date wood charcoal, we can date um, any number of things as long as it used to be alive. And the amount of radioactive carbon that a, a living organism ingested in its body during its lifetime gradually begins to decay. So the proportion um, is based on uh, the amount that decays over the half-life of whatever element, uh, radioactive element we're looking at. So radio, radiocarbon dating is an important dating technique. And we also have ways of dating potsherds using little sand grains that accumulate electron charges uh, as a part of background radiation. And so we can date by resetting it uh, in the laboratory and determining how long it's been accumulating charges. Um, we also use very advanced techniques to determine compositions of artifacts. Um, I have a little instrument in my office that's called a PXRF, or a portable X-ray fluorescence machine. Um, it allows me to get semi-quantitative data on the relative proportions of elements in a potsherd, for example. And so by using population level data, like a collection of potsherds that look one way and another collection looks a different way, I've been able to determine, for example, that the ceramics that we have um, uh, for, that look Native American are mostly local produced. They're consistent with local pottery. But other pieces that we thought and were pretty sure that they were Aztec, that were brought by people living in Mexico at the time, do indeed have a different uh, composition. Um, anyway, there's a range of other things you can do, but basically with the fancier techniques like neutron activation analysis, which costs money, you have to send things away to labs, you can actually source, for example, copper objects that might have an impurity of lead if you can determine the relative uh, proportion of specific isotopes of, of lead, you can determine which mine in which nation around the country, whether it was Mexico or Spain or Germany, uh, where that specific source of copper with lead impurities was originally from. And that, of course, tells us a lot about uh, the economy and transport and travel during the 16th century, uh, which gives us a broader reconstruction of what's going on. Uh, we also can do things like uh, uh, dietary reconstruction, um, and we can source where animals came from, or even, for that matter, people. Um, for example, we have a pig jaw that we found on the site, we think it's 16th century. We're going to have to radiocarbon date it. We got a grant to do that, but haven't done it due to the um, uh, pandemic as yet. Anyway, the point, though, is that we can look at how old it was if it's 16th century. Then we can look at what that pig ate. Um, we can look at stable isotope ratios of carbon and nitrogen inside the bone to determine, for example, whether it had a predominantly corn diet or whether it had a wild diet or whether it ate a lot of seafood. Um, things like, you know, fish, fish remnants, whatever. We can also eventually determine, if we do this uh, strontium uh, isotope analysis, we can determine where in the world that animal may have grown up. So, for example, it might eventually be able to be determined as a, a pig that was uh, of a, a Spanish DNA, for example, if we got DNA analysis. However, it may have grown up in Mexico or maybe born in Cuba and then eventually grown up in Mexico. We can determine that by comparing the tooth 
isotopic analysis, which formed it in, in as a juvenile, uh, to the long bone uh, uh, isotopic ratios, which tells us more about its a recent diet as an adult. Anyway, so there's a whole bunch of science that can be done, scientific techniques that can be applied to help us with tracing um, many aspects of the uh, of the archaeological record. So let's get into the actual meat of it. I'll uh, talk about the Lund expedition. I'm going to kind of give a brief background, um, just contextualize what's going on, and then we'll get into the actual findings. Okay, so now uh, to shift gears. Uh, in 1559, which is when the expedition arrived in Pensacola, Florida, uh, the southeastern United States was not occupied by Spaniards who had up to that point, occupied many, many areas in the Caribbean Basin, Northern South America, and uh, Middle, Middle America, uh, New Spain particularly, uh, modern-day Mexico, and Central America. So what you see there on this map is a map that shows established settlements as of 1559, and you see two areas uh, to the north, one in New Mexico and then one in Florida, which several Spanish expeditions had visited because the Spanish obviously wanted to colonize there, but which no foothold had yet been established, no successful foothold. Of course, those areas weren't really unoccupied. They were simply unsettled by Europeans. There were hundreds of thousands of Native Americans living all throughout these areas. Um, and, of course, by the time Luna arrived in 1559 in Pensacola, many expeditions had previously been there. This is just a map that shows the prior exploration, all the major expeditions that went into the interior of Florida, um, and the reason this is important is that the members of the Luna expedition included a few veterans of the Hernando de Soto expedition from 20 years earlier. And so some of the captains that Luna brought remembered the Soto expedition. And so their plan, at least, was to come to Pensacola Bay and then go inland in Alabama and eventually follow the Soto expedition route back across the Appalachian Mountains and then come down to the Atlantic coast and eventually set up shop uh, at, uh, on the south coast of South Carolina. Because that's what the king originally wanted. He didn't, honestly, the king of Spain, Felipe II, or Philip II, didn't care about settling on Pensacola Bay. His original goal was set me up an ex uh, a colony on the lower Atlantic coast at a place called Santa Elena, uh, which we now know as Paris Island, South Carolina. Well, Luna's expedition was to land on the northern Gulf Coast from Mexico and then make their way down to the Atlantic. They never made it. It was a total failure. But thanks to that, we still have our archaeological sample of what an expedition was like in that period. There's the expedition itself. I'll get into more detail there. You can see they never quite made it over the mountains. Um, then we see that the reason, one of the reasons that the Spanish were attempting to settle in Florida in the first place was to head off French settlement. And it turns out that Luna literally, as soon as he left, one year later, the French really did come in and settle in precisely the spot the King of Spain wanted, uh, Paris Island, South Carolina, a place that was named Charlesfort by the uh, French. And then their subsequent colony, both of them failed. One reason was that the Spanish came in later, as you can see here, uh, in 1565, four years after Luna's expedition failed and withdrew, you can see that Pedro Menendez de Aviles successfully settled St. Augustine, Florida, and attempted at least to militarily uh, set up a string of forts and a road all the way back across the Appalachians. His goal by that northern Appalachian mountain expedition was to basically achieve what Tristan de Luna had failed to achieve and get over uh, the mountains and eventually set up a road directly to Mexico. Most people in that era had a very poor sense of geography. Uh, Menendez thought it was a lot closer between Florida and Mexico uh, than it actually turned out to be. All right, so <clears throat> that's the expedition as it was intended on the left, upper left, and then down on the bottom you can see as it actually was implemented, including some uh, after they pulled out of the um, uh, settlement, you can see the actual routes of the ships that attempted to go up and uh, set up shop at Santa Elena. Um, they didn't like it, so they turned around and left and didn't do anything, frankly, after they uh, lost most of their expedition. So why did Luna's expedition fail? Well, uh, five weeks after they pulled into the bay and settled, uh, set up a, sh uh, a location for their new settlement, um, a hurricane, a big hurricane came through 
and ultimately uh, devastated the fleet at anchor. And so, uh, to make a long story short, after the hurricane, of the 10 ships that were floating in the bay, only three were still afloat. Um, and as a result, most of the food that they had not yet unloaded because they wanted to keep it safe before they built buildings on land, most of the food that they had for 1,500 settlers uh, went down in the, in the wrecks. And thus, a uh, total of seven ships were destroyed. Most of their food was destroyed and, and devastated. And so they were left stranded and without much food and in seriously dire straits. So anyway, that was uh, the reason why they sent many, many relief expeditions subsequently over the next two years. It's also the reason why Luna um, left uh, 100 guys but sent most of the people inland to the native province of Piachi, somewhere near Selma, Alabama. Um, and you can see the routes of various attempts by the Spaniards to go into the interior, meet some of the native groups that had previously interacted with DeSoto, uh, and see if they could barter for food. But unfortunately, the interior Indians had mostly experienced the really nasty side of Spanish conquistadors. Um, Hernando de Soto was a, basically a thug, um, and unfortunately, he had devastated the interior. Uh, they tried to attack him in central Alabama at a place called Mabila, um, but they lost. And so Soto was responsible, thus the Spaniards were generally responsible for uh, literally thousands of native deaths, and thus the Luna expedition honestly couldn't get much help from the native groups. In fact, the natives, in the end, uh, burned their fields, burned their towns, pulled out, even cut down all the wild herbs in the vicinity of where the Spaniards were, and then finally attempted to actually kill the Spaniards, small parties of them, whenever they could, just to encourage them to leave. Uh, and they did eventually, but of course that was uh, just a temporary departure of the Spanish who came later uh, with Menendez on the Atlantic coast. All right, so the settlement itself remained undiscovered since 1561 when the Spanish pulled out um, until uh, the initial stage of learning where Luna's settlement was was in 1992 when the Emmanuel Point One wreck was found in Pensacola Bay. It was a 16th century galleon, uh, and I'll talk about it in a moment, but the point here is that um, the Emmanuel Point landform turns out to be very, very close to where the shipwrecks are. And in 2015, we had a local resident who came in and he, he had previously been on some excavations with uh, our, our uh, prior department chair, Judy Benz, and had uh, learned enough and knew enough about the archaeology of the area that when a new house was being constructed, he did a little looking around and saw that there were 16th century artifacts and all over the place. And so in the end of 2015, we spent about six days in the field, digging lots and lots of holes, getting a sample of the artifacts, and then eventually, of course, we did more to learn about the site. Uh, since then, we've had five years of excavations. All right. Just to show you where the site is and why they settled where they did, uh, this is a, a storm surge map, modern-day storm surge map, that shows Pensacola Bay and the red is the lowest lying areas, the areas that are swampy and easily inundated. And of course you get up to the yellows and, and eventually the blues, and that's the low areas. But you can see that there are some areas where the water comes right up against higher ground, and those are the areas which would be appealing. So number one, Luna wanted to have quick and easy inland access. He wasn't setting up a shore or a port settlement. He was setting up a port that could then immediately establish a road Inland. He brought 500 soldiers, and their goal was to move inland pretty quick and see if they could pick up the old Soto route in central Alabama. Next goal was that he wanted to be able to see the mouth of the bay, meaning whenever passing ships came to the mouth of the bay, he wanted to be able to see them from the settlement, and he wanted them to be able to see the settlement to facilitate access and supply, resupply, and communication and transit. And then finally, he wanted high ground, in other words, away from inundation, uh, and deep water, or deep enough at least to bring large ships up, including 600-ton galleons, uh, of which they had a couple that they were that large. Anyway, that spot right there, you can see, is the only, literally the only spot in all of Pensacola Bay that satisfied all three of those requirements. And that's precisely where we found and have been exploring the Luna settlement since then. And so just to show you where all of this is, um, 
you'll see here a map. Uh, this is modern day Pensacola Bay up in the upper left, and then a close up. Uh, downtown Pensacola is off to the left in that lower map. And here you see a blue blob. Well, the blue blob encompasses the entire Luna settlement and all three shipwrecks that we have since found. Number one was the 1992 find of the Mania Point One shipwreck, the Galleon. 2006, a second Galleon, or eh, probably a now a large cargo ship was found uh, near it. Or, or actually, in this case, it's an uh, uh, um called the Hulk. Anyway, the point is there are two shipwrecks. The, the terrestrial settlement was found in 2015, and then very shortly thereafter, uh, underwater survey was conducted between the shipwrecks and the shore. And in 2016, the very next year, a third shipwreck was found. That's a manual point three. So we have three shipwrecks there in the settlement, all within the space that's indicated on that map. So at the University of West Florida, we have an amazing underwater archaeological program, a maritime archaeology program, and we have a terrestrial archaeology program. And so we are in the same department, we have the same resources, and we, we collaborate and coordinate with each other. And so UWF has been working on this project since the 90s, really, but now it's ramped up exponentially now that we have uh, an additional couple of shipwrecks beyond the one found in the 90s, and now we have this large settlement. So I'm going to real briefly kind of go over a little bit about some of the things on the wrecks. These are maps that show Emmanuel Point 1 and Emmanuel Point 2. Um, you can see the ballast pile, which is how the first one was found, well, that and the iron in the large anchor. Um, and then down on the bottom, you can see the image that shows the portions of the Emmanuel Point 2 wreck that were excavated uh, and have been excavated for many years now. These are just some images showing uh, students, student divers working. We have a graduate and undergraduate program in maritime archaeology, one of the few graduate programs that has active research. And so the Emmanuel Point fleet of which we have three wrecks identified, but um, there's three more left to be found uh, that are underwater. Uh, one was actually pushed up on land. That counts for the seventh that was destroyed during the big hurricane. Just to show you some of the artifacts, um, there's a copper cooking cauldron on the left underwater. Um, you can see a large stone cannonball on the right, a wooden gun or artillery piece uh, carriage wheel still in situ. And just to show you, this is the kind of things that were typically carried on, on armed vessels during this period, uh, artillery pieces, lots of firearms and pole arms and body armor. Um, well, many of these pieces have actually been found in these wrecks. Uh, this is the kind of weaponry that was used, uh, cannons that didn't look exactly like what we might think of today. These are very early style cannons. Um, and you can see they use lead shot with iron cubes on the inside. You can see the stone cannonballs. We have yet to find any actual uh, artillery, but eventually we might get lucky and find some that didn't get picked up by the Spanish originally. Uh, here's an amazing uh, breastplate, um, a feto, which was in Spanish at least, which was uh, found uh, in the Emmanuel Point One wreck. And it might very well have been a personal possession of one of the captain, uh, one of the officers, but it may also just have been what was on board the ship uh, as standard uh, cargo or equipment for the crew. And you can see uh, we actually found wooden shafts for crossbow bolts uh, and four copper crossbow bolt tips in the manual point one. So anyway, it's an amazing assemblage. You can see here the anchor, really, really large piece uh, that was pulled out of the bay back in the 90s, I believe, or early 2000s. Uh, here's some Aztec objects. There's a head pot uh, painted in, these are Aztec tradition ceramics. Um, and we have blades, these little obsidian blades that may represent part of Aztec weaponry, um, about a hundred Aztec uh, warriors, or what they called Indios Soldados, or soldier Indians, were brought from downtown Mexico City as a part of the Luna expedition, and uh, these may represent traces from their equipment on the ship that never got uploaded. We have lots of ceramics, you can see there are various types. Uh, these are a few, basically pocket change, and then over there on the bottom right you see some scale weights. Uh, all they brought was basically their own personal possessions. The Spaniards weren't in the habit of bringing treasure on ships that were sent to colonize. So this is, again, just pocket change that these people uh, were being paid with and you know, maintain their, their personal economy. Uh, lots and lots of organic debris. Um, underwater archaeology is really neat in the sense that uh, anaerobic environments down inside the mud oftentimes preserves organic materials in an amazing way that we never, ever see on land. 
Here you can see a wooden spoon, a leather shoe sole. That's probably a man's shoe, even though it may not look like it. Um, barrel hoops, uh, possible guitar peg, uh, all it fits, and then lots and lots of food remains and bug remains that even allow us to say something about the cargo. Um, anyway, it's amazing stuff. We have lots of students doing thesis projects um, focusing on all these little specialties within each of our uh, shipwreck projects. Uh, one of my favorites is a manicure set. This was found by the dredge. It was sucked up out of the bottom of the ocean in the dredge, uh, in the uh, underwater dredge, and it was from the pump well at the bottom of the manual point two. And you can see it was even a whistle. They had a whistle on one end, and it had a plate thing you could use to clean your fingernails, and it would have had an ear earwax scoop as well that didn't, didn't turn up. All right, uh, what I focus on more than anything is the settlement, the actual terrestrial site. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the Luna settlement was, like I say, initially found by a surface scatter of artifacts. In other words, it was found by accident. Even though a number of people, including me, kind of thought this was going to be the location it should be, uh, but we finally found it in 2015, and in a year or so since that time, uh, over the course of most of 2016, the Archaeology Institute at UWF ran uh, teams running shovel tests. So in other words, a shovel test survey was conducted over many, many hundreds of, uh, well, more than 100 lots, I believe. So this is a private residential neighborhood, and so we ended up having to interact with well, many, many scores and scores of landowners. And the neighbors have been amazing. They immediately embraced the project once we had a neighborhood meeting. And so uh, at some level, uh, I think only five people out of all of these uh, landowners initially turned us down. But the point is what we were doing was getting permission to go dig small holes, 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter, and sift what was in them and see if we could determine the distribution of garbage, essentially debris, associated with any prior human occupations. And so the goal of these nearly a thousand shovel tests that were dug over the course of a year was to determine how big was the 16th century Spanish settlement based on the distribution of 16th century Spanish artifacts. And we dug areas outside, you know, beyond where that was in order to do what we call bounding the site. So you have to know what's in the site, but you also have to know what's off the site and where it ends and consistently confirm at least that you've got an actual uh, blob. So this is a, a hex map that shows the results. Uh, what we've done here, and this is for what we call olive jar. It's a type of Spanish storage container that mostly was used to carry wine and vinegar uh, and afterwards uh, water. But these large amphora-shaped vessels uh, broke and scattered all over the place. And so you can see in these hexes what we've done is it's the average weight divided by the area we excavated, which means it, it averages for areas we didn't excavate much, and it corrects for the areas we did excavate much. But you can see that the distribution is bounded. It's got a, a, a specific distribution on the high terrace up in the upper right, and you can see in the topographic map sort of in the background, you can see how it descends to a lower area where there's a low, low density scatter. Now, to, to, to correlate with these olive jar fragments, we have many other artifact categories, and that's the distribution maps for these. One is lead glazed coarse earthenware, um, which is basically just cooking pots, pans, etc. We have carrot head nails, a very specific kind of wrought iron nail that is not found. In fact, the Luna site is the latest archaeological site in North America that they've ever been found at. Um, they've never been found at St. Augustine because apparently their use diminished after that point or disappeared. And we have majolica, which is tableware, basically plates and bowls used for dining. And we have Aztec ceramics, which correspond to not just the fact that there were Aztec Indians on the expedition, but also all of these Spaniards, for the most part, were at the time that Luna left Mexico, Veracruz, these Spaniards were living in Mexico. So these were new Spaniards. These were not people coming from Spain. This was the actual, actually the first Mexican expedition to the United States, in the southeast at least. Um, so, anyway, the point is that these distributions are pretty consistent and show that we really do have the same suite or assemblage of artifact types all dating to the mid-16th century and all concentrated in a certain area on the site. So we've done a lot of excavations. We've done uh, a total of four field schools. We were going to do one this summer, but we just 
canceled it because of the pandemic uh, issue. But you can see there on that map, it shows not just the shovel test, but all of the excavations, big blocks that we've opened up. Uh, we've also, for example, whenever a landowner goes in and puts in a water line trench, or maybe even puts in a new house, most of them have been giving us permission to go and uh, have a look before the disturbance is about to happen. So we can kind of get a grab sample of what's there. We can see if there's any post holes or anything in the way of traces that would, you know, bear further investigation. So very briefly, um, I wanted to go over at least what the settlement really was. Um, the name of the settlement was called Santa Maria de Ochuse. Uh, Ochuse was the name that the native peoples at the, the time of the DeSoto expedition called the bay. The Spanish simply adopted the name Ochuse. Um, and so Santa Maria refers to the fact that they entered the bay on the day of the Feast of the Assumption of the uh, Virgin Mary, and that would be on August 15th. Um, so Santa Maria de Chuse was the name of the bay to the Spanish, uh, and it was the name of the settlement. There were 1,500 people. Like I indicated, there were about 500 soldiers, both infantry and cavalry, uh, about 200 Aztec warriors and craft people, 100 of them were warriors, six Dominican missionaries, because by this time Spain was more in the business of assimilating and converting native populations rather than conquest. So. The early phase, uh, prior to about 1543, the early phase of Spanish expansion was definitely dominated by military conquest and uh, many things that lived up to the black legend that emerged later. But by the time Florida was settled, and certainly by Luna's time, um, the whole point was to treat the native peoples well, apart from obviously setting up shop right next to them uninvited. But beyond that, um, the attempt was to uh, negotiate with them to uh, not take anything except with paying them uh, and get permission, uh, you know, within reason, obviously, um, to, to, to settle and do things. Anyway, the point, though, is that uh, the Dominicans were there to, to missionize. And they had another thousand, well, maybe 800 or so Spaniards, including a few wives and children of the Spaniard, Spanish soldiers. Um, they had African slaves, they had free Africans, they had servants who were probably mixed blood, African, Indian, and Spanish, various mixtures. So it was a really um, diverse ethnic group that all originated out of Mexico, modern day Mexico, what was then called New Spain. So the original plan was to set up 100 lots for 100 heads of households who would eventually settle there. Most of the soldiers were just going to quickly move inland and then have a central area with about 40 lots set aside for public buildings like the church, uh, a plaza, the governor's house, and uh, like a royal warehouse. So the kind of structures we're looking for archaeologically are the ones listed below. Uh, houses, tents, barracks, whatever we can find related to housing, a uh, plaza, definitely a royal warehouse, and a church, which would be where they buried all the dead. Uh, I think we found the warehouse, at least the area. Um, we have not found the church. Uh, it might even be just right under a street today because it is in that, a residential neighborhood. So one of the big questions that in the field I've been trying to struggle with is, did they have enough time before the hurricane hit to set up a formal street grid like they normally did in this period? You can see the map there that shows the kind of uh, planned urban uh, settlement that would have been eventually grown there. Or, after the hurricane, did they end up mostly just turning this into a standard temporary army encampment, in which case we might not expect to see substantial structures, um, or at least not many of them. Um, and that matters because when I'm digging, I need to know, am I looking for post hole patterns, rectangular structures, and substantial architecture made out of wood, or is it very likely to be just mostly just scatters of artifacts with the occasional post set into the ground to uh, hold up a tent. So the way the wooden structures would have looked like um, is actually drawn in some documents from the era. You can see here um, the, the type of structure would have been made out of poles and split wood planks, uh, thatched roofs, possibly plank or shingle roofs. And you can see in some of these illustrations lots and lots of iron nails. And we, we do find nails, lots and lots of nails. Um, and, and they're all wrought, which means they're forged in a, in a, by a blacksmith, not obviously with modern techniques. So we can distinguish them from the modern nails. Or do we have something like this? Do we have an encampment? Um, 
And a lot of those are characterized in army encampments in Europe during the 16th century because of the endless wars in Europe. So archaeologically speaking, we have some comparisons we can make between these two uh, alternative options. So if we were to say that the grid of 140 total lots were spread out, spread out on the landscape, this is a rectangular box that would cover the actual documented empirical uh, distribution of artifacts. So this right there would be sort of a very, very hypothetical projection of what the original settlement might have been intended to look like. And there was a beautiful little pond, a freshwater spring originally there, right below the site. Uh, we think that they settled there partly because it's a nice high bluff, about 30 feet above sea level, uh, and it's very, very level. And then they had a boat landing which was lower, and we found artifacts scattered around in what showed there is an activity area. So another aspect of the archaeology of the site is that the population level didn't stay constant across the two years that they stayed here. And the reason I know that is because the documents talk about movements of most of the people inland for about five or six months. Uh, and then, obviously, uh, as people began to evacuate, every time a relief fleet showed up with new supplies, the sick and the unwilling to stay would leave. Um, and so gradually the population dwindled. But the point here would be, if you notice this chart that shows sort of maximum and minimum population estimates, it might suggest that during the times when there were very few people living at the site, they lived in the core area of the site, probably right around the plaza, or at least that's my guess. And so the idea is that the only area of the site that would show intense debris, intense post holes, intense fire pits and things, cooking debris, um, would be just around that core area because that's the only area of the site that was occupied for such a long time. The areas of the site that were occupied for the first six months, you see that first six months before they left initially, might only have a small scattering of artifacts. So in other words, the artifact concentrations around the site ought to reflect some hot spots, some areas in the site that are high density and areas that are low density. And so to evaluate that, I split the site up into analytical units. Uh, what I wanted to do was take the average density of artifacts found in each one of these units and the total artifacts found in each one of these units uh, of different types and see if I could d discern are there hot spots, are there areas that have great density of artifacts and others that don't. And the simple answer is yes, there are hot spots. Uh, what you can see here on the top is the weight per square meter of three different categories of pottery, of ceramics, Spanish tableware, Spanish cookware, and Spanish storageware. And then on the bottom, you can see I've modified that by the amount actually found, the actual weight of artifacts. And so what you're seeing there is that the area that are surrounded by uh, red bubbles uh, shows that there's a hot spot right around the core area on the edge of the bluff just above the water uh, spring. And then there's a couple of other spots. One other spot is down by the boat landing, what we infer to be a boat landing. And another hot spot is up on the bluff edge, which I think was a, kind of the northern watch post, the, the gateway uh, for horses to head up north. And they also wanted to keep an eye on the bay in case, obviously, native groups came canoeing down or, God forbid, the French came in and attacked them. Another category is wrought iron fasteners, meaning nails, uh, spikes, things like that. Same distribution information as the ceramics. We have three major hot spots, um, the same hot spots, in fact, for the most part. And then additionally, you see just a listing of the count of artifacts found that are in the arms and armor category, uh, lead shot um, for arquebuses and muskets, uh, crossbow bolt tips, armor fragments, and bits and pieces of other things. But you can see that that central area is the main hot spot. And then up there in the northeast corner, which is actually in the lower left, uh, is where we have a kind of a secondary cluster. And finally, uh, Manos and Metates. These are obviously not native to Pensacola. We don't have any volcanic rock here, but these are basalt. And they are Manos uh, from Manos and Metates, which are corn grinders. And so these long kind of loaf-shaped stone objects would be used to grind corn on Metates, or the grinding stones. And they were brought in, we have documents that said that 3,900 pounds of basalt manos and metates were brought. And this was because the Luna expedition was mostly supplied with New World foods. So the vast majority of the grain that they brought was not wheat, it was corn. 
and corn had to be brought in and dried the whole grain. Then it was soaked and turned into hominy right before eating it. And the hominy was then ground on the metates, and then they would make it into tortillas. And so the point, though, here is that these monofragments imply that the area where they were processing and using the most food is also corresponding to those two specific little hotspots that we've got in all the other artifact categories. And so finally, um, in, in getting into the archaeology of this area, we also try, have been trying to open up very broad areas to see if we can find actual localized activity areas and evidence for architecture, post holes, things like that. Um, and what you're seeing here are a couple of Florida sites that date to slightly later time periods. The uh, Fountain of Youth site is in St. Augustine or near St. Augustine. It's the original settlement that Menendez made. Um, and then on the right you see Santa Elena, which is where Luna would have settled, but where Menendez did settle on Paris Island. And the point, though, is that you can see, particularly here, I've cleaned it up a bit, there's a map that shows rectangular patterns of post holes. You've got little buildings around a central plaza. Um, they're about 10 feet apart from each other, these post holes. So what we're looking for potentially, at least if we want to look for structures like this, is a pattern of linear, linear distributions of post holes that might be as much as two and a half or more meters apart from one another. And that takes a long time to excavate. So we've been working on it. Um, we are actually point plotting every single uh, Spanish artifact and most of the native artifacts that we find, which means we're digging really, really slowly. But when we point plot, we're using um, a total station, which has a laser transit and a little prism there. And as you can see, the top-down view of a 3D uh, model and then a side view, with this 3D plotting, we can actually use the computer software to be able to rotate around and, and see what the distribution of artifacts is. Uh, of different types, and what you're looking at here is a, a point plot map that shows what I think is an area that may be the house of the official treasurer of the expedition, Alonso Velasquez for Vegas. And that's a, a somewhat of a wild guess in the sense that um, it's not certain at all, but there's some evidence to suggest that the only person who might have lived there, the likeliest, would be the treasurer. Uh, and I'll show you the artifact in a second. Anyway, so since 2016, we've dug three times in this one area. And as you can see, this is what post holes look like. Um, they're not particularly impressive or pretty, although the one on the left, top left, 3008, is actually a really solid post hole. It's got a, a burrow that went through the middle of it, so it sort of has a gap there. But um, we got a radiocarbon date off that, which means it dates to the 16th century. It was stuffed with Spanish olive jar, and the post itself had a nail in it. So it's clearly a limit post, and so what we've been doing is trying to expand two by two meter units and one by two meter excavation units around that one post that we really have solidly dated and see if we can find additional posts that relate to that structure. And all that cloud of densely distributed uh, Spanish artifacts and native artifacts is right in and around this area. So ultimately we'll have a map that shows where the post holes are, if we have them, and we do. Uh, and potentially where the walls are and then what the artifact distribution is on the inside of structures versus what's on the outside. Anyway, so this is all part of the empirical data that we're gathering. This map shows photographs of each unit taken from above, uh, kind of pasted together there. And then what you're seeing is a distribution of documented, certainly or likely postals. Um, and what you see is that there's at least one broadly linear pattern of post holes. One of them is that 3008. Um, and uh, down in the lower left, you see another few post holes as well. Uh, it's really slow going. The, the spacing between these is fairly consistent to the ones at Santa Elena. And what we may have here is the beginnings, at least, of some sort of 16th century wooden structure that the Luna Expedition built. And it just so happens that it's sitting on top of a really dense distribution of smashed olive jar and lots of other artifacts. Uh, we found pretty much the entire range of things in these units. But this has taken us three, three years worth of 10-week field schools in the summer just to get this far. Um, so you can see it's really, really slow work. Um, and then we have to process everything in the fall with student help and then eventually process the numbers and crunch it all and write it up. Uh, I, I expect I'll be doing more of that this summer since we're not going to be in the field. And just to show you a couple of images, 
uh, of the more interesting features. These are pits that cross-cut the horizontal strata. This is a photograph of a trash pit. Now, this trash pit isn't terribly big. It's maybe the size of, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, two feet around, and more than that, maybe, yeah, two feet around, and then maybe a couple feet deep, two and a half feet deep. But it may have been a subground storage area where somebody set one of small-sized barrel down into the ground, and then as the barrel rotted, the barrel hoops, were eventually it was just stuffed back, back filled with trash. And those hoops that you're seeing are iron straps that would be wrapped around the, the barrel. Um, and you see lots and lots of pottery fragments. We found a range of artifacts from a bale of, of brass wire to um, bits of a, of a comal, a ceramic comal, which is a griddle used for frying tortillas, to a smashed Native American pot that we think that the Spanish were typically looting from the local villages after the Native groups left. Anyway, this is, this is a dark uh, soil type that's full of uh, trash, full of uh, charcoal and ash, um, and probably uh, as well food remains as well that have since mostly uh, disintegrated. This is a profile cut that's through both sides of a slot trench that we dug through the, literally through the heart of this little trash pit. And you can see up in the top image, you can see the image of the sherds, the uh, fragments of the large native vessel, you can see the uh, iron straps and a few other uh, Spanish ceramics uh, hanging out of the wall as well. We came back two years later and finished this excavation uh, as well. So again, it takes a long time sometimes to even get small features out. But this feature is totally pristine, which means it was excavated in the 16th century. Well, it was excavated sometime between 1559 and 1561. It was then filled precisely during that same window of time and since then, there's been no disturbance. And so in, in all the contents of it are a single sort of time capsule of artifacts that relate specifically to the Luna expedition. And, and everything in it is exactly the right age and is consistent with what we expect. And finally, I think my last slide, um, just a, a sampling of the types of artifacts uh, just gives you a, an overview of the range of things. Um, we have literally thousands and thousands of artifacts uh, all over the place. The site itself is about 31 acres in size, uh, about a little under 15 hectares in terms of uh, metric measurements. So it's, a, it's the largest 16th century European site in all of the continental United States. There is no other, even St. Augustine wasn't this big because they didn't bring that many people. They learned that you don't need that many people and they can be a liability. <laughs> as Luna found out. Anyway, you see here crossbow bolt tips on the bottom right. Um, several things, the scale weight, little bitty biscuit shaped thing made out of brass, that is a 10 Castellano weight, exactly 45.1 grams. And that weight would have only been useful for measuring bulk gold, like jewelry or personal possessions. And since this was a colonizing expedition by soldiers and ordinary everyday people, most likely that would only have been likely to be owned by the treasurer of the expedition. And since that's what we found in that block of excavation units around the post hole, that's why I suspect that may be the house, the residence, maybe even just the office of that particular treasurer. Uh, and over there you can see, above that, you can see a sheet silver star. Uh, one of my favorites It's a little bitty sheet silver star, tiny thing that we have documentary evidence was fairly fairly typical for what called the Spanish in that period called a disciplina, which is a, a little penitential flail. And it usually has a series of knots, knotted cords, but it, they sometimes had two or three or four of these little silver stars to do additional damage. It was part of religious uh, penitence, penance. Um, think the scene in uh, the Da Vinci Code movie. Um, but anyway, we found one of these in that trash pit. And over to the right is a little bitty brass gold-plated, there's not much left of that, but a little bitty gilt brass horse charm with the chain still intact. Um, and we found that in the area that I suspect is the most likely site for Tristan de Luna himself to have resided. So it's possible that was part of a ornamentation along his bridle or perhaps something he wore around his neck. Um, I'm still doing research into what these things might be. Um, anyway, you see a range of artifacts there. The beads down on the bottom were intended for Native American trade or gifts, more likely they would basically walk around with strings of glass beads and use that as a sort of diplomatic tool and would probably trade these items for uh, foodstuffs or whatever else. 
All right. Uh, so that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, I would be happy to take questions. Let me get rid of that and bring up this. So I don't know if there's any way uh, y'all want to ask questions. Be glad to entertain them. Um, Vicki Norwood had a question here uh, a minute ago. It said, uh, does the sand hold up to your excavations, that it looks pretty shifty? <laughs> it, uh, with great care and continual moisturizing, we spray water, uh, very fine mist when we can, and we cover our units every night, and we have to be super, super careful to walk like a foot back from the vertical walls. But your observation is totally uh, accurate. In other words, we are digging in essentially beach sand. It's, uh, Pensacola has, is known for its coarse sugar sand. And uh, so, yeah, this sand is quite unstable and difficult to maintain vertical walls in. It is a rare field school that we don't have some wall collapse on us. So we try to be, we've developed techniques for, for being very, very careful. but. Um, you're totally right. It's uh, it's very very difficult. One other bad part of the digging in sand is that sand is so porous and coarse that organics quickly move in and out. And so, typically over time, the organics in a post hole that might be really crisp and easy to see to an archaeologist in a clay soil, in a sandy soil, sometimes these post holes are really really tough to see, and the edges get really um, fuzzy. So it's very challenging archaeology from a logistical standpoint. Um, we do our best, and uh, we've made a lot of progress. But yeah, we, we pretty much expect that sand occasionally to uh, fight back. Okay. Um, I how how far down is it? Do you usually begin to find stuff? I mean, is there a certain level? Um, you know, it seems like that after this many centuries that, you know, you'd have to dig deeper than it appears you're digging? That's an excellent question. Um, one, of the, one of the things about our site is that since it's up on a high bluff, it's a high level terrace, um, it's really not in an area that ever receives sediment discharge. In other words, there's nothing higher than it that would bring debris or uh, sand or silt or anything else down on it. And so we're basically in what we call an upland landform. And so the only thing that deposits occasional sand is that there's a constant beach or a bay breeze. And so the original beaches along the shore would occasionally pick up sand. And so there's a, probably a little bit of a rain of, art of, of, of sand that comes down. And there's leaf litter, but there's also a little bit of erosion, you know, in other words, sheet wash. So my point is, it turns out that the original ground surface that Luna walked on is very likely more or less the same ground surface we walk on, with the exception that uh, a lot of the yards they brought in sort of an orange clay sand as fill for the yards that are a little lower than others. But yeah, for the most part, um, the ground has not changed. It hasn't gone up and it hasn't gone down, partly because it's level and high. But that what has happened, and this is where your question comes in, Ray, um, a phenomenon known as bioturbation, um, roots growing through the soil that subsequently rot, ants that dig nests that subsequently collapse and fall in, um, uh, worms, all of that sort of biological activity that occurs in the top soil layer results in artifacts that used to be up here gradually making their way down a little bit lower, a little bit lower, um, and we call it bioturbation. And so in our site, we start digging at the ground surface, and then normally uh, we've learned that about 15 to 20 centimeters down is when we begin to find the Luna period artifacts. They've been in the ground for, well, four to 50 plus years, and that's how far down they've migrated at the top. So between about, say, 15 to 20 centimeters, and then as deep as about 35 centimeters is where we find a lot of the artifacts as well. So. Once we drop below 35 centimeters, which is, what, just over a foot, um, we don't find much after that point. So we drop down below the modern soil, we get into the artifacts, we drop down below the artifacts, and then we get into what we call subsoil. And there's the occasional artifact that ended up down there, sometimes because of a post hole, but also because sometimes, you know, a tree may have grown deep and 
rotted, and then a, a, literally the artifact just fell down a little deeper. But yeah, it's all pretty shallow. Um, but unfortunately, because of that coarse sand, the bioturbation brings the artifacts down a little bit deeper than they originally were, but they don't tend to move horizontally. So part of the thesis study, actually one of my students is working on a thesis now to look at the relationship between bioturbation and the activities of the people on the site, you know, when they were kicking around sand, and what's the relationship between where the artifacts are now and where they were originally, and how we can use the horizontal and vertical distribution to understand what was going on and better reconstruct the site, you know, during the 16th century. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, one one observation and then a question. Another question for me again. Uh, nobody else is asking anything. Nobody else is putting anything here on chat. But um, I was really interested in, in your map that showed the extent of Spanish settlement. I didn't realize that they had, you know, set settlements so far north. I mean, I always think of, you know, coastal Florida and things. So that was that was really, really surprising to me to see that uh, and interesting. And the question I had was, in your archaeological career, what is the 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 single thing, or maybe it's a couple or three things that have made you almost want to jump up and down and go, wow, you know, Eureka. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, my goodness. There's a few things like that. Um, I guess for back in the 1980s, mid-1980s when I was in grad school, I did a survey uh, of a section of the Flint River in middle Georgia. Um, this was not long after, it was 1986, 1987, not long after I was at uh, NYSC. Um, and I remember getting out of the uh, car and starting to collect in the field, looking at a plowed field for artifacts to determine whether there was a site there, an archaeological site. And one of the first things I found was a midsection of a spear point, a big landfill at spear point. It would have been something like that long. And it's uh, what we call a Clovis point. And at the time, at least, the Clovis culture was thought to be the oldest North American culture, literally the first colonizers of North America. Um, and so Clovis, a Clovis point is a really rare find. I, think, I found exactly one in my whole career of, I mean, I've been doing archaeology since 1981. So um, anyway, long time. So I, I was very, very excited about that one. Um, one other that I would bring up would be that um, at a Spanish mission site that I was digging on in 1990, um, I was sifting the dirt from this Spanish mission from the early 1600s, and uh, I and the guy who I was working with at the same time saw it at the same time, and it was a little bitty tiny brass finger ring, uh, but the finger ring was basically one of the little gifts that was probably given to one of the new converts, and in it, it had a little bitty piece of glass set in a bezel, um, and the glass, when you look behind it, had a little sliver of wood. And so uh, we're pretty sure that what that was was intended to represent a relic. It's a reliquary ring. So that little bit of wood would have been said to have been a piece of the true cross, the actual cross of Christ. So, you know, it was part of a, um, a catechism of the native groups inside the mission, the, teaching them about the faith. And that little mission ring, that little reliquary ring, was very exciting to find. It was on a day it was snowing. Um, so anyway, I remember it very, very distinctly. Oh. Um, had a question here from Joel Brown that says, uh, "What else have you learned from digging the sides about artifacts? Uh, example given: anything about changes in climate, storm events, uh, anything else relating to the natural world?" Well, there's a ton that we have on our radar to learn. Um, one of the most important ones is that, you remember the um, image that I showed, there was a spring, a little enclosed sort of a sinkhole in the sand matrix. We're not really sure how it formed, but nonetheless, it shows up on maps back into the early 1800s. 1807 map shows that little lake called the Laguna. Anyway, the point though is that um, my hope, and I'm working with our environmental science department here, um, I'd like to get a coring sample down into that sinkhole lake and I, my hope is that if we do that, it's possible that that little sinkhole may actually date to the Ice Age, 
um, or more recently, but nonetheless, it's a sink and it's a trap for pollen. Um, and if we can get enough organic material to be able to date little slivers of that along the way and then see pollen grains and phytoliths and any other uh, evidence about the local environment, what I'm interested to learn is if we can see on the, on the local scale, uh, what was the environment, what was the natural environment, what was the forest cover, what, were, uh, what was the environment like in, the mid, in 1559 to 1561 when Luna was there? Um, can we see any direct evidence in that, uh, in that hole, in that sinkhole, of the 1559 hurricane, which was a real monster, you know, an actual storm, maybe not a storm surge, but rather like a rain, rainfall deposit with a water lane sand lens. Um, but all that being said, apart from learning about what happened on the Luna expedition, um, those kind of coring samples in the immediate vicinity of the Luna um, site may give us a multi-century, maybe even multi-millennial scale environmental sequence. Um, and we could potentially see what the frequency of hurricanes were, if we could ever identify what a hurricane signature looks like in that particular hole. Um, there's other things, too, that we could do, and actually I almost certainly will. Um, we have a really rich record of Native American occupation on the edge of the bluff. Um, we found spear points on this that actually predate Pensacola Bay. They're about nine to 10,000 years old, and the waters of the bay had not even entered after the rise of the sea after the end of the Ice Age. So, so here's the thing. We have a lot of shoreline bluff edge native sites, little scattered campsites, and they're full of shellfish. So a lot of the material that was being brought out of the bay by both the Native Americans and the Spaniards was shellfish. Well, there's plenty of ways now developed to develop or to understand using isotopic evidence from inside the shell, the growth rings of the shell. We can eventually do a lot of environmental reconstruction if we were to take shell from the same terrace, from that same immediate vicinity, and then take it from archaic and woodland and Mississippi period archaeological sites with shells, and then also the Luna period, and we might be able to reconstruct uh, proxies for uh, salinity, um, uh, uh, temperature, rainfall, a lot of these things can come right out of, the, out of the shell record. And in that sense, the archaeological context allows us to pin down dates and contexts, you know, like, like uh, what people were doing and what the shells actually looked like, uh, how big they were, for example, the population of shellfish in terms of large versus small. And so, yeah, there's a lot of environmental reconstruction that over the long term, um, in association with this sort of maritime landscape approach we're taking on the shipwrecks and on the terrestrial uh, Luna site, um, I absolutely hope and intend for us to do more environmental reconstruction for sure. And in that sense, it'll contribute to a growing body of literature uh, in the southeast and elsewhere in the world, uh, of, of, of hopefully of, of useful utility and importance. Okay. Um, I have a question here. I don't know who this is from because it's somebody has dialed in using a phone, and so I only see the phone number, not not uh, a uh, a name or anything. But okay. They were, they were asking uh, when. Uh, uh, well, not when, but why did the 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 settlement cease to exist, or do you have any information on that? <laughs> well, it's uh, it, it was mostly because well, when the, when the colony was originally sent, um, they had Native American four women who had been brought out during the DeSoto expedition, and then they were brought back uh, as advisors. And their recommendation was that the Spaniards should bring enough food so that no Spaniard in the expedition would need to lean on or rely on native food. So in other words, they would, wouldn't pressure the local Native Americans. Um, what happened, unfortunately, was that when they lost all of most of that year's worth of food for 1,500 people, um, they, they were basically starving at that point. In fact, we have detailed accounts of them boiling their boots and eating leather and going out and getting herbs that they didn't know what they were, and some people died as a result. So they were, they were literally starving. And so... Um, over time, uh, the logistics of resupplying this expedition, they weren't intending to do this much resupply, but getting all the supplies from Veracruz, Mexico, shipping them across the Gulf of Mexico, it took them basically six months between each expedition to bring food. Uh, 
And each ship that arrived, or each fleet that arrived, there were only four, um, brought less and less food. And so as people got sick, as people died, um, the people in the army and basically all the officers, everybody but Tristan de Luna, desperately wanted to go home. <laughs> and so what ended up happening was all of his officers began to take negative uh, stances against every move that Luna made. And Luna was apparently ill, or at least he seemed ill to them, uh, crazed. He may have even had something like malaria because he had these periodic uh, episodes. But anyway, the point is, is that he uh, fought with them, and they, we have a ton of litigation. And that's one of the reasons I know so much about the expedition is because Luna, when he finally was deposed, he was thrown out as governor because the viceroy said, you know what, they're not paying any attention to you. You're making some really bad decisions. Uh, you're out. So when Luna left, he took a copy of hundreds of pages worth of litigation to Spain. Spanish Crown did not ultimately forgive his debt, but, and he died in poverty in 1573 in Mexico City, but the litigation was left in Spain, and that's how I know so much. But the point here is that it was Luna's uh, lack of ability to pull his officers and everybody along with him uh, to make a go of it. Uh, and his recalcitrance, and the fact that they really, really were on hard times, that by the time, um, let me think, by, the, by spring of 1561, when the new governor arrived, new, new guy appointed by um, the uh, viceroy, uh, there were only 160 people left. So, honestly, it just became more and more of an onerous burden uh, on the suppliers to supply food. The viceroy eventually just decided to pull out and then 1562, they all met back in Mexico City and, and, and talked all the options over, and they said, you know what, it's not really worth it. And so they gave it up officially. So it was basically, if I had to say the, the biggest factors in the failure of the expedition were, one, they brought too many people. Uh, they shouldn't have brought 1,000 people over and above the soldiers. Uh, two, they had the hurricane, which wiped out their food. And three, Luna did not prove to be an apt administrator. He was really inflexible and ended up condemning all of his officers to death officially, even though he said, obviously, we'll wait till the viceroy confirms it, which obviously he did not. Anyway, it was a bad scene and uh, in the end uh, only lasted two years, but it was the first multi-year European settlement in the continental United States. St. Augustine was after it, but of course it actually did survive. Um, it, it was able to supply itself from Cuba a lot easier than Luna was able to supply himself out of Veracruz. So that does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. Well, I don't see any more questions here. Um, so unless somebody logs on here and asks one thing, but really appreciate your time. This was really interesting, and I, I, I you know, I mean, we're, we're science campers. We like learning stuff. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> and I, I certainly learned a lot today. So really appreciate it, and uh, and thanks so much. And everybody else, you know, people are sort of, you know, saying quite interesting, fun, thanks, and stuff like that. So we really appreciate it, John. Well, I'm glad to do it. I really appreciate the invitation. And uh, anyway, I hope everybody continues to stay safe. And uh, anyway, it was great to do. Great to be with you guys. Okay. Thanks a lot, and, and stay tuned for further webinars. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right. Bye now. <laughs> bye, everybody.